It is such an honor to be here at Wheaton. I just, I, I love Wheaton, um, and I'm really humbled to be able to, to speak with you tonight. Um, and Jane, congratulations. What a well-deserved honor. I feel like I should yield the balance of my time to hearing you talk more about being led as a leader, learning to be led. Um, that, was, that was really beautiful. Um, so, so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start this talk by telling you a story about my dentist. All right, this is Dr. David Yee, and he's my dentist in, in, in San Francisco. And there's his, there's his office. It's just, just below his apartment in the Sunset District in, in the city. And uh, he's been my dentist for about 20-something years, ever since I started teaching at the University of San Francisco. And uh, when we first met, he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a, I'm a development economist. And he's like, what is a development economist? And I said, well, I go around go around the world evaluating development programs. And he said, oh, that's nice. And, and, uh, and I said, have you ever thought about going on one of those dental missions? He said, no, I'm, I'm just a, a homeboy. The city's enough for me. And uh, over, the, over the next, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, you know how you have those conversations with your dentist or whoever that just kind of loop like an eight-track tape and you have the same conversation <laughs> every time? Well, that was sort of my relationship with Dr. Yi until, in, I think it was 2011, he said, when I was down in the chair with my mouth open, muttering these sounds, um, he said, hey, I went on a dental mission. I wanted to tell you. And I said, really? I said, that's, that's fantastic. Where did you go? And he said, I went to Jamaica. And I said, that, that's, that's great. Um, and I guess he'd been, he'd been prepared to go down with his plaque scraper and his spit sucker and his bags full of floss and mouthwash and stuff. And the missionary dentist down there said, you, know, you won't need all that. All we do is extractions, okay, in, in the dental mission. So a dental mission looks like this. This is a picture of a dental mission. Um, and so when he got there, when he, when he landed on the tarmac in Kingston, she said, did you bring your forceps, which is what you use for extractions? And he, and he said, yeah, I brought my forceps, like he told me to. Um, she said, how many extractions can you do in a day? Do you think you can do? And he never really thought about this. or never really tested it, especially with the San Francisco upper middle class patients, right? How many extractions can I do in a day? Um, and he said, well, how many am I, maybe eight? I think I could do eight. How many am I supposed to do? She said, well, yesterday I did 140, <laughs> right? And I liked this, hearing about this missionary dentist because she thought like an economist, right? I'm an economist, right? So she realized that, that cosmetic dentistry has really not much of a place in, in dental missions because infected teeth can be fatal. So, um, so these are pictures of kids with infected teeth. If the infection's in the lower jaw, it can actually cause an infection that causes swelling and can, can cause asphyxiation. Um, if it's in the upper jaw, it can lead to sepsis of the brain through the nasal cavity. Right? So infected teeth can be fatal. And what this missionary dentist knew is that this sort of bang for the buck the best way that we can care for these people, the best way that we can love them is by, as a whole, is by focusing on extractions. And so, and so that's what they did. But aren't most of us a bit like Dr. Yi? It's like we want to help. We want to do things that, that help the poor and the marginalized, the disenfranchised. But we're just not really sure what's, what's effective. And that's what, that's what this book, uh, Shrewd Samaritan, is about. And it's based on two two parables that are both found in Luke. And the first one, everybody's, how many people have heard of the Good Samaritan? I expect pretty much, at Wheaton, I expect every hand to be up in this room. <laughs> um, so the Good Samaritan, as you know, man's injured on the road. Um, priest walks by, passes on the other side. Levite walks by, passes on the other side. And then the Samaritan, right, this, this group of hated people, essentially by, by the Jews at the time, um, long story behind that that maybe we'll talk about in, in a bit, picks up the guy, puts him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, helps heal him, has to go about his business, pays the innkeeper to take care of him, and there you go. And it's all a response to, um, to this lawyer's question, who is my, who is my neighbor? And this is the, this was, this is the answer. Um, so a little background on, on the Good Samaritan. So this, it's on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and there are bandits all along this road, and if we do a close-up here, this is an actual photo <laughs> taken on the road to Jericho at a time when real bandits were planning an, an, an ambush there. Um, so so what, what is so radical about the Good Samaritan? And so the, the, the book is based on these, on these two parables, 
the Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan is radical because, first of all, the protagonist, the good guy in the story, is a Samaritan. And, and the, the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans was such that the Jews had a saying, the person who eats with a Samaritan is like the person who eats the flesh of swine. Right? So I don't know if you could say anything worse about somebody or a group of people um, than saying something like that. It's also radical because relationships back then worked through reciprocity. You cared for people in order to be cared for back. So, and Jesus sees through this, right? Remember at different times in the, in the Gospels, he says, don't just care for people who care for you. Care for people who can't repay you. Then my Father in heaven will, will reward you, right? So what the lawyer wants to do in response to Jesus' question, we, he, asks, he asks Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer replies, well, who is my, who is my neighbor? And so he, he, he responds with a parable. But what, um, what the lawyer wants to hear is, Jesus, he wants to hear Jesus say, care for the people around you. Those are the most important people, right? And the lawyer wants to check that box off. But instead, what he tells him is to care for the anonymous person that can't repay. And in doing that, he changes the whole ethics of how we think about this anonymous, if you want to call it like global neighbor, rather than just the neighbor in our network, which has changed Western ethics ever since, right? This is, we even have Good Samaritan laws, you know, based on this parable about our moral responsibility to this anonymous person. Um, so it's truly a, 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 radical, a radical parable. Um, he also changes the, the, you know, the lawyer says like, um, who is my neighbor? But Jesus, if you remember at the end, he says, who was a neighbor to the injured man? So he changes it from, a, from, from an object to the subject, who is a neighbor, right? Um, the second, second parable is the shrewd manager. How many people are familiar with the, the parable of the shrewd manager? I bet fewer hands are going to go up. See, like even at Wheaton, only about half the hands are up. The shrewd manager is a really weird parable, but I love it. It's one of my favorite parables in, um, in the New Testament. And, and the story goes like this. You have this, you have this manager so that, w- that was probably working for, it could have been a Gentile or a very rich um, Jewish person, landowner um, and merchant at the time. And he's cooking the books. And the boss catches him and says, I'm going to fire you. And he's like, oh, shoot. I'm, too, I'm t- too old to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. What should I do? I know what I'll do so that people will welcome me into their houses. And so he lines up his master's creditors. And he says, how much do you owe this guy? And then it's like 900, 900, uh, 900 barrels of oil, 900 gallons of oil. Okay, make it, make it 450. Right? And the next one, says, he says, how much do you owe my, my master? 1,000 bushels a week. Make it, make it 800 just between you and me. Make it 800. Right? And so what Jesus says is the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. And he says, this is the quote, so he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. So when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Seems like a weird parable. It's, it's sort of oddly, oddly weird because Jesus is, is pointing as an example to this guy who's, who seems to be this fraudster, right? But what can we learn um, from this parable? So understanding a couple of Greek words actually help us here. So, so one of them is the word... Um, mamonas, okay, which is in Greek. So, if, so if you're 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 a math major, or um, or a Greek scholar, you know how to read that word. So, mamonas, and that comes from the old the um, the word mammon, like in the King King James version, which means money or worldly resources, right? And so, this is what Jesus calls us to employ shrewdly. Um, the second word is the word manager, which is pr- pr- pronounced. Uh, Oikonomon or akoinamon, okay? So you can kind of, if you know Greek, you can kind of sound that out, okoinamon, right? What word does this remind you of in English? Can you see it? The root, you know how a lot of our words have, have Greek roots? Can anybody see it in there? It's economics, okay? So this guy is literally the person's economan. He's the person's economan. He's his, his manager. Who's in, and economics is about the stewardship of resources, so he's steward of his resources. So what does this econo man understand that Jesus thinks his disciples don't understand? 
or maybe that he thinks that we maybe don't understand. So one is that an assessment of cause and effect sounds very basic, but an assessment of cause and effect is good, not bad, right? And especially in context, it's good to be shrewd and not naive, right? So many times we kind of think, well, what God wants from us is our good intentions, right? And what Jesus is saying, uh-uh. No, I want you to learn to think shrewdly. And in another, in another place he says, be as shrewd as serpents, but as innocent as doves. Right? So there's this component of shrewdness and understanding, if I do this, it will result in this other thing that we see in Jesus' teachings. The other thing that he seems to be saying is use resources to build relationships, not vice versa. Right? So it's like, I don't know if anybody knows like Amway, right? these, these kind of pyramid schemes where you sort of... Right? In Amway, you use relationships to build your resources. What Jesus says is use resources to build relationships in some way. So how do we use our resources to build relationships with our global neighbor? And what does it mean to apply parables like these to understanding what our responsibility is and how we can have a, a meaningful and effective relationship with our global, global neighbor? So, so Shrewd Samaritan is about not only loving our global neighbor with our heart, and our good intentions, but learning to love our global neighbor with our minds as well. So what I've found is that people in this process of, of, of relating to their global neighbor tend to pass through six stages, which I call the six eyes in this process. And the, the first stage is ignorance. So this happens often when we're, when we're kids. We just don't know about the rest of the world. So when I was in third grade, I had, I had no idea that only half the world could read or write when I was in third grade, and I'm not that old. <laughs> Um, when I was in fourth grade, I didn't know that there was a famine in Bangladesh that killed maybe half a million people. When I was in fifth grade, I didn't know about the genocide under Pol Pot that killed millions of people. I didn't know about the thing. I was just, I was ignorant. I didn't know. I was more concerned with, with um, buying a skateboard with polyurethane wheels so I could keep up with my friend Mike so I wouldn't be left out of the gang. In the neighborhood. That was really what was on my mind. But don't we still, don't we still let our minds get pre preoccupied with stuff like that, right? Um, in the parable, in the Good Samaritan, a lot of people think that the priest and the Levite walked by the injured man because of ceremonial washing concerns, like not wanting to touch a dead person or an injured person. As a behavioral economist, I think that he walked by the guy because of strategic ignorance. Strategic <laughs> ignorance is a behavioral economics term. It's like why people who think they might have HIV don't get tested or think that they might have cancer, don't get tested. Because knowing certain kinds of information would cause you, would compel you to act in a way that would be uncomfortable. So it's just better not to know. And so some of us remain in this stage of ignorance, even when we have the chance to understand things, but we, um, but we choose not to. So what's true about, the, um, about this, the status of world poverty today? So I'm just going to show you two graphs, one global and one domestic. So the good news is that, and this is, this is the share of the population living in extreme poverty. And the good news is that's coming down. And it's coming down really fast in certain parts of the world, like in South Asia and Asia, Latin America, fairly quickly. It's coming down in Sub-Saharan Africa, although it's not as quickly as we would, as we would like. Um, what, about, uh, what about domestically? So on this axis of the graph, um, this is the share of per the percent of the population living in extreme poverty from 1985 to 2015 in the developed countries, in the majority world. And on this axis is the share living in extreme poverty in, um, in the United States and Europe, the two, the two black graphs. Now what you'll notice is about, th th the gray lines sort of replicate the last graph. But what you'll notice about the, about the black lines is that it's in the United States uniquely where the number of people living in extreme poverty is actually increasing. In the United States, it's one of the only places in the world where the, where the share of people living in extreme poverty is actually going up rather than going down. You can see like Europe, it went up for a little bit. You could probably guess why it went up temporarily. That was, that was when um, West Germany was kind of digesting East Germany after unification. Poverty went up for a while, now it's back down. But in the United States, for the last 20 years, there's this, been this steady increase in extreme poverty. Public health people are seeing diseases that we thought we'd uh, now um, in, in poverty pockets, for example, in the South, for diseases like intestinal worms that we thought we'd eliminated 75 years ago. And they're back um, because extreme poverty um, is higher in this country. 
So that calls us as Christians to act, not only globally, but, um, but domestically. Okay, so the first stage is ignorance. The second stage is indifference. So we may know about some of these things, but we just, in practical terms, we just don't really care that much. What's our society consumed with? In, in, in large part, any increase in income or time that, that we have, what do we use it for? I think we, a lot of us use it for just entertaining ourselves more thoroughly, <laughs> right? Any increase in pay we have, a lot of it goes to just buying a little bit better of a vacation for the next vacation we have, or a little bit bigger of a house, or improving our house, or doing different things that, and on all of us, I speak of myself as well, that, that in, in, this, um, in this place that we have in living in the world, our concerns mainly flow around our own well-being. And as rich people, um, around our own diversion or entertainment. Um, so, so I'm going to do a few exercises with you, and this is the first one. I want you to reflect on a, on a major purchase that you made in the last few months for yourself. So this could be like a new, a new car, it could be a new bike, it could be a new uh, mobile phone, it could be camping equipment, an appliance, anything like that. Okay, I want you to think of just something that you bought for yourself in the last few months. And then after you've thought of that, I want you to think about some kind of consumer choice or donation that you made on behalf of the poor. So it could be like you bought a pair of Tom's shoes, which gives, um, which gives a pair of shoes to a child in a developing country for every pair that we buy. Or it could be maybe you bought a cup of fair trade coffee, or, um, or maybe you made a, don a donation to a nonprofit working for the poor. But I want you to think about, about both of those about both of those decisions, the donation slash responsible consumer decision, or, or the donation, or, or the purchase that you made for yourself. And I want you to think about which time, which, for which decision did you spend more time considering? For which decision did you think about more about the impact of the donation or the consumer choice, or about the quality of the product that you bought for yourself? Which decision did you spend more time? And I, and I, and I want you to, to raise your hand if you, if you invested more time, effort, and thought on the donation or the responsible sort of consumer product. Okay. Normally, in a crowd of this size, it's just one or two hands, right? which is absolutely right on the dot because only 3% of Americans even American donors even claim to have researched the impact of their no donations. But think about that for a minute. If only 3% even claim to have researched the impact of their do donations, probably only 1% actually did, right? And then, but then the question is like, why did we give if we didn't really care very much what the impact was? And maybe, what, what do you think the answer would be to that? Conscience, maybe? Just kind of, it, like, Guilt alleviation, like we need to feel good, we feel bad about being rich, and so we give, right? But it doesn't seem to be to have, like, to really care for that person that's the beneficiary of that donation, right? Seems to have more to do with our own feelings. Okay, so the third stage is a reaction to the indifferent stage. It's, it's what I call the, the idealistic stage. Um, and and it's, it's, it's when we come to this realization we're not indifferent, we just have to do something. We have to do something about global inequity. We have to do something about domestic inequity. We feel really bad, so something has to happen. The problem is, idealism is often all about me and feeling good about believing that I've solved some problem instead of actually solving the problem. And this is the stage that, I, that most of the college students and even grad students that I interact with are, are, are often at, is this, is this idealistic stage. The problem is that, that idealism lacks this, this sort of serious investigation of a problem or the cause of a problem. Um, like what caused the problem and what could I actually do about the problem that would have the effect that I want, which is to actually promote human flourishing or to improve, um, improve the lives of the poor and the marginalized. It also tends to lack boundaries that make the action sustainable. Notice like in the Good Samaritan, even, even the Samaritan had, put, had some boundaries when he cared for the injured man. Does anybody see where the boundaries were? Did he enter into this codependent relationship with the injured man where he let the injured man dominate every course of the rest of his life? No, what, what did he do? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he substituted a little bit of his money for some of his time. Obviously, he had to be doing something to go out, to be walking along that crazy road. Or he's probably a merchant that had some business to do in, in Jerusalem. So he delegated some of the responsibility to the innkeeper and then promised to repay the innkeeper. But notice he did have boundaries that made what he did sustainable so that he could, he could help others, right? Um, he could get on with his life and so that he could help others. When we, don't, when we enter into a relationship with the marginalized, the poor, the needy, where we don't have boundaries that make our actions sustainable, then, then it doesn't last very long, right? And, and um, our effort usually doesn't result, doesn't have much of an effect. Idealism also lacks a commitment to follow through. I notice like college students who are, who are in the idealistic stage, they'll, they'll go from one thing to another thing to another thing. Just, you know, a new interest just kind of takes, takes place of the, old, of the old commitment very, very quickly. And what we need instead is a, is a patient commitment to a group of people or to a cause to really understand it and really understand the effects um, of, that, of that intervention. Okay, the fourth stage, the fourth and fifth stages um, are when I think we, we, we see our relationship with our global neighbor really begin to develop. And the first of these is investigation. So this is when either formally or informally, we ask ourselves serious questions about, okay, what's the cause of this problem? And what can we actually do that will genuinely help the people that we're purporting to help? What can actually help? Um, and it could, be, it could be a formal investigation, or it could be just simply if it's, if it's more of a, um, a local situation, just asking the person what they need rather than just assuming that we have the answers for the person. But just investigating in, 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 a, in a humble way what, what the needs really are. So I want to talk a little bit in, in this context about the three people who won the Nobel Prize last month in, in economics. So Abhijit Banerjee, Esther DeFlo, and Michael Kremer. Because they won it, as you can see, like um, when they made the announcement, um, for their experimental approach to allevi alleviating global poverty. And so these guys, the reason they won the Nobel Prize last month is they have done more to teach us about what works and what doesn't work than arguably anybody else. And they've led hundreds of us that work in this area of experimental and behavioral development economics in a running randomized control trials and quasi-experimental quasi research that tries to get at this question about what actually, what actually works in development. So, um, so this is exercise number two. And I'm going to describe 10 interventions that are, that are listed here that are, are interventions that, that ordinary people often give to or are involved with in one way or another. And five of these are really good, rigorous, scientific research has shown to be effective, and five are not that effective. They're either just moderately, barely effective, like don't have any effect at all, or, or are actually harmful. Okay, and it's gonna be your job to guess which are the five, all right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through them real quick, and then you're, I'm gonna give you like a minute to talk to your neighbor and, and, and tell your neighbor the five that you think are the effective ones, and we're gonna see who gets the most. In, in, in the, actually, no, let's play a game. Let's play, see if you can guess more than Kent. <laughs> okay, so we'll see how many people in the room can get more than, than, than Kent, okay, on this. So the first one is, um, so there's a huge digital divide both domestically and globally, and maybe we can bridge that digital divide by giving kids computers, like i.e. Um, laptops, um, laptops that they, where they learn to access all this world's knowledge on, on the web. Um, second one, um, maybe, so the Tom Shoes I mentioned before. Um, shoes prevent uh, worm infestation um, through the soles of, of kids' feet. Uh, worms, and I'll talk about this um, uh, in a sec with deworming pills, but worms feed off the iron in our blood, and um, without iron, it's really hard for kids' brains to develop properly when they're young. So it can cause long-term cognitive damage. So, um, so shoes, giving kids shoes might help prevent worm infestation. Also, shoes are required for school in many countries, and so maybe giving kids shoes allows them to go to school. Um, deworming pills, so I just talked about deworming. Um, very, uh, they're, they're not very expensive, and, um, and drugs like al albendazole are intended to eradicate worms in, in children. Parenting coaches, so providing parenting coaches to at-risk families and at-risk moms to help them to raise their kids better. Um, this is a, a widespread uh, uh, widespread intervention, both informally by churches and then, and then formally um, even by local county and city governments. Fair trade coffee. 
So fair trade coffee guarantees a higher price when there are low coffee prices, okay? So right now it's like at 140, I think it's $1.40 per pound. And so, and in fact, right now coffee prices are below that. So it guarantees coffee growers a higher price and maybe that really helps them take care of their, take care of their families and earn more money from their coffee. Direct cash transfer. So, so if you give money to give directly on the web, you can do that like right after this lecture, you can go on the, on the web and donate $100 and, or, and 94 of those dollars will go directly into the, um, into the electronic savings accounts of an impoverished East African family. You could do that, you could do that right now. No strings attached, they can use the money however they want. So the question is, what's the impact of that? Um, you could provide a microfinance loan through Kiva online. So microfinance is low, small loans to budding entrepreneurs in the developing world. Um, how effective are microfinance loans? Child sponsorship, so you could sponsor a child for like 30 to $40 a month and provide uniforms, school fees, tutoring, basic health care, things like that. Clothing donations. So people spend a lot of their money on clothing. So maybe if you give people clothes, it frees up money in their budget to buy other stuff that they, that they need. Christian missions. Shoot, maybe all this stuff doesn't work. Maybe, um, maybe we should just go preach the gospel. But what, what, is, what effect is, does just planting churches and preaching the gospel have on outcomes like you know, health, education, economic outcomes? You know, is it, is it effective in increasing people's livelihoods? Okay, so you have one minute to um, guess which are the five effective ones and, and tell your neighbor. And let's see if you can beat Kent. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, you guys want to see the answers? Okay, decide on your five. Decide on your five. All right, here we go. Here are the answers. Okay, the green ones are the effective ones, right? Or at least what sort of the best current research shows to be the effective one. You got zero? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's, so let's go, let's, uh, before we figure out if, if, if you've beaten Kent, let's, let's go through and, and, and talk about these. So giving kids laptops. So one laptop per child is, is um, an NGO that's based in, in my fair state of California and has been one of the, the idea of giving kids computers to improve educational outcomes has been one of the most studied uh, interventions in the, in the last five to 10 years. For one laptop per child and other computer donation programs, not a single study has found, has, has found any increase in learning or even the desire to learn, okay? Um, the best news about one laptop per child is that, well, two things. One is that the kids, the, the, the one positive impact they found is that the kids know how to work that computer, that, that kind of computer that was given to them um, better than the kids who were not given a computer, which to me is like, duh, of course. Um, but also, um, the good news is that they put blockers on it so the kids can't use the computers to browse pornography on the web anymore. So that's good news. Um, Tom's Shoes. So we, we did a randomized controlled trial with Tom's Shoes in El Salvador with 1,500 kids and basically found that the shoes did not really do very much at all. Um, except they seem to make the kids more aid dependent. So like in, in the response to the question, should your family provide for its own needs or should outsiders provide for your family's needs? They were much more likely to answer that the outsider should provide for their needs because they were sort of given this stuff. Um, deworming pills. So Michael Kramer is one of the guys that won the Nobel Prize. Um, this is a study that he did in 2004 with Ted Miguel, who's a professor at UC Berkeley and was one of, the, one of the studies that they cited, that the Nobel Committee cited um, as, as being um, one of the seminal studies that used experimentation to look at, at poverty interventions. Huge impacts from a 50 cent intervention on school attendance. Even today, they're doing 20 year follow-up studies on the kids that got dewormed in Kenya, in Western Kenya for this experiment, and they have 10% higher incomes and 10% higher levels of consumption, unbelievable higher cognitive levels because basically their brains were able to get the iron that they needed to develop when they were kids. Amazing study, game-changing, world-changing study. P 
parenting coaches. How many people put parenting coaches down? Okay, all right. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, so there was a study done by, by David Olds at University of Colorado in the 80s where they, it was called the Nursing Nurses Parenting Partnership, where they matched these public health nurses with these um, single moms, um, usually dad not in the picture. They matched them up with the, with the single moms and prenatal all the way till like three years old. And what they found, uh, even just like five years after the study started, that was that child abuse was down 50% among the treated group. They kept following these guys because the study was done. Um, the study was done way back, um, or the, the intervention was done way back in the 80s. So they could follow these guys for the next 30 years. So they found, like right around the time these kids graduated from high school, 40% 40 um, 40 reduction in high, being a high school dropout. It, everything was 40%, like about a 40% reduction in incarceration. 40% uh, reduction in violence, about a 45% reduction in smoking and alcohol use by the kids, an unbelievably effective intervention. So the RAND Corporation did a, um, a cost-benefit analysis on it and found that for every dollar they invest in this project, it returned $9.40 over time, discounted as well. Um, fair trade coffee, I could talk for a long time about fair trade coffee. <laughs> Bottom line is it just doesn't really work that well. If work is defined as increasing the incomes over a long period of time for coffee growers, it'll help them a little bit in times like now, but the coffee growers have to pay for certification, and that payment for certification plus all the costs they encounter in having to comply with the fair trade rules on labor and pesticide use and everything um, just about outweigh those gains, and then when coffee prices are high anyway, they pay those costs and don't get much of a benefit in return. So over time, over time, it comes out about the same. Yeah, question. Do you know if that's just fair trade in general, period, overall, or is that just Yeah, coffee? I've had that question a lot, and, and, and all I can say definitively is coffee. And, and we can talk, in the Q&A, we can talk about it more, but certain kinds of direct trade seem to be, for reasons I can talk about later, seem to be much more effective than fair trade. That's a good question. E-cash transfers. Who put unconditional cash as one? Only, okay. Okay, a few people. Yeah, this has been, this has been a, a more recent innovation, but what we found is simply giving people cash is a really good way to, to give the poor agency over their own choices and results in big reductions in poverty, at least short and medium term. And very, very little, actually um, what they found in, in a meta, World Bank did a meta study on unconditional cash transfers and found that in none of 17 studies did people increase their consumption of alcohol and cigarettes or other temptation goods, what, what we call temptation goods. So this kind of, there's this sort of myth that people use money that we give them just to, you know, to get drunk or something like that and just not, not borne out at all in the, in the data. Now this is a different population than if you go to a homeless person on the street and give them a dollar, okay? So remember that. Um, what we know about uh, those kinds of unconditional cash transfers is about 30% goes to narcotics and alcohol. Okay, but these are cash transfers to people overseas. Microfinance loans. How many people put microfinance down as one? Yeah, this is the one that trips up a lot of people. Man, about 10 years ago, we thought microfinance was the silver bullet, like that this was, that this was it for, for eliminating poverty. But since then, about eight or nine, maybe 10 randomized controlled trials have been done all around the world in microfinance, and it just doesn't, at least doing more of it, just doesn't have a very big impact on, on incomes. It promotes entrepreneurship, which is really good. It helps people to smooth over bumps in their income, which is really good. But it does not have overwhelming impacts. There's this, there's this broad consensus that, that, it, that it really doesn't. Um, there's some newer studies that, that add more nuances to that that we could talk about later, but, but it's not the silver bullet that we once thought it was. Child sponsorship. So, so this is another study that I was a part of where we looked at the outcomes of 10,000 individuals, a whole bunch of whom had been sponsored, and this was with Compassion International. Um, what, was, what was awesome for us is that when Compassion rolled out a bunch of programs in the 1980s, they had this eligibility rule that said that only kids 12 and under in the village were eligible to be sponsored, and so the kids 13 and over weren't. So what we were able to do is we were able to compare the life outcomes of those siblings that were a little bit younger than the eligibility rule with the adult life outcomes for the kids that were a little bit older. And what we found is that the kids that were, the kids that were sponsored had um, about two more years of education. They're about 35% more likely to have a white collar job 
They were much more likely to be community and church leaders. Their income was about 20% higher. They lived in better houses, more likely to have electricity. Um, their houses were made out of better materials. Just an unequivocally uh, positive impact. That being said, it's an expensive intervention. Um, so these guys, it's, it's about $3,000 over the sponsor life of a child from like age about four to four to 18. So it's expensive, but it's really, really effective. And, um, and it's something that ordinary people can do that, that is, a, is, a, is a great thing. Um, okay, clothing donations. So this is one of the ineffective ones. Do you guys notice something? How many people watch football? Okay. All right, do you know, if you could look at this picture more closely, you'd see that they're wearing Cincinnati Bengals Super Bowl champion t-shirts. What is the matter with this picture? What's the matter? They've never won a Super Bowl. So what are these guys in Africa doing wearing Cincinnati Bengals Super Bowl champion t-shirts? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah, right, 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 right. No, it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah, so, the, so they, they have them ready to go in both cities, right? So when, the, when, when the, the, the one team wins, they're able to sell them to these euphoric fans at like $30 a pop, right, for these cheap T-shirts that say Super Bowl champions. The other ones, they pack up into pallets. They give them to World Vision, who sends them down to El Salvador. And I know, because I've seen them in the basement of World Vision El Salvador. <laughs> they are there, <laughs> right? Um, so imagine, this is one of the harmful ones. Imagine if you're trying to eke out a living in a little clothing shop in a village in El Salvador, and the t-shirt dump truck backs up into your village and dumps a bunch of clothing into your village. What happens to your, what happens to your, your little store? Right? You can imagine, right? Prices go down. Volume goes down. Maybe your store even goes out of business, right? So, um, and this is, this is what uh, Fraser in 2008 found with clothing donations in, um, in, in Africa, is that it, that it severely depressed the indigenous textile industry there. So this is, this is not a good way to help people. Think of the difference between that and that, like the t-shirts and the cash. So let's, th so let's think like economists for a second. What happens if more people have cash and you own the clothing store? What happens? It's boom time, right? Makes your business thrive, right? Whereas like throwing the t-shirts all over your village makes your business go out of business, right? So, so this, is a, this is a case where we, we want to be shrewd and think about, okay, what effect are we actually having, say, between cash donations and in-kind donations? And this is one reason World Vision has, tri has tried to convert all of this eventually to cash donations, especially in, in disaster relief. Like instead of just, just um, imagine like with grain, like, like um, sometimes you need to donate food, like in, in, in really dire emergency situations, but we have to be really, really careful, say like in a, in a rice cultivating area where we drop rice, bags of rice on disaster victims, because what does that do to the rice farmers? Depresses the local price of rice, and then they join the food lines as well. So we want to provide incentives, whereas if we give cash, what does that do to the local rice farmers? They earn more money, they recycle it back in the economy. Okay, so we have to be um, smart about how we do these things. Christian missions. Okay, this is Wheaton College. How many people raise their hands for Christian missions? All right. Yeah, so this has been one of the most exciting areas of secular research in the last five years. And, and I can mention a bunch of studies. I don't want to run out of time. Um, I'll, I'll just mention two. So, so one is by Felipe Valencia, which, is, which came out real recently in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is considered to be like the best journal in economics, where, um, where he went down to, um, to South America. And how many people have seen the movie The Mission with Robert De Niro? It's like 30 years old. Yeah, everybody that's over like 45 is raising their hand. If you're under 45 and you haven't seen it, rent it on Netflix or something. It is a great, great movie. Um, they worked um, in the movie. It, it portrays the Jesuits working among the Guayani, which is a, a tribal group that overlaps Brazil, it's Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Uruguay, or Paraguay. And, and so what he did is he found these maps where the Jesuits were working, these geographical maps, and he went back today, 300 years later. So the Jesuits worked there 
150, for about 150 years back in the 1700s to the early 1800s. And then they were kicked out for political reasons. But he wanted to see if there were any lasting effects from the missionary work that they did there, which is a very holistic version of missionary work that would make almost any missions organization happy today. So they focused on, on livelihood. They preached the gospel. Um, it was a, a really neat sort of holistic kind of mission that, that, that they did there, which is actually portrayed in the movie. What he found was that in these areas, literacy is 30% higher today than in the neighboring areas where the Jesuits didn't work, and incomes are 10% higher. Right? Which, and, and there are all these checks that he did on the data that, that made it publishable in the, sort of this best economics journal in the world that are really, really impressive, the econometrics that he did. Very, very careful study. Another study has looked at by Nathan Nunn at Harvard University, who I, I, don't, I don't think comes from a faith background, but shows that in all the areas where Christian missionaries have been working in Africa, literacy rates are higher in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's a study by Robert Woodbury, who's at Baylor now, that looks at missions across the world and the formation of democracy. And they find that where all these Protestant missions were, like 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, there's greater formation of democratic institutions in these, in these areas. And he shows all these channels that it happened through learning people to cooperate together, through Christian teaching, through literacy, through all these channels, democracy is more prevalent where missions were in. So if anybody ever tells you that Christians have never done anything good in the world, even by secular outcomes, even aside from preaching the gospel, it's just not true. There's a bunch of secular research that shows that these, these secular outcomes, like education, income, and so forth, are much higher in places where um, missions have occurred. Okay, so how many did you guess? How many, um, how many did Kent get? Five. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So Ken's still the smartest guy in the room, or at least tied. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so how many people got three? How many people got four? How many people were like Kent and got all five? Anybody? You did? You got five? All right, Kent, you have a, you have a peer. <laughs> all right. Great, great. Um, so, so one, one sort of almost like parenthetical mar remark I wanted to make, that this is a question that I get a lot, and, we, and again, we could talk about it later um, in person or in the Q&A period, but does Christianity matter with poverty interventions? Like, does, and does it matter sort of in outcomes, for example, like whether it's a faith-based NGO or, or nonprofit doing the work or a secular nonprofit? Does it matter? And I would argue... I mean, first of all, that the evidence shows that even Christian missions that aren't overtly trying to do development work are actually really effective, but that as Christians we can think about, we, we should think about development in a very different way. So, so our worldview and our faith, when we're thinking about impact, I mean, it affects the clarity of our motivation for sure, right? In, um, in our faith, very overtly, Jesus tells us to love our neighbor, Right? So, so there's, there's a completely compelling reason for us to do what we might call sort of development or relief work that's a much more torturous argument to make with, say, like with a non-theistic motivation, right? Why we should do that under a, a non-theistic belief system. Second of all, one could argue that, that, that what we would want in terms of our goal for doing relief and development work, which is human flourishing, generally accepted to be human flourishing or kind of integral development or the development of the whole person spiritually, psychologically, socially, physically is, um, is different than secular indicators that really just focus on education, health, and economic outcomes. Those are the three outcomes that are, for example, in the United Nations um, Human Development Index. It's an equally weighted measure of those three, right? Whereas if you take those same people that created that index and ask them, what makes your life thrive? I bet you they will list you know, without putting it in this context, I bet they will talk about relationships. I bet they will talk about good friends. Without using the word, they'll talk about virtue, right? And as, and as, and as Christians, we, we should not be shy to invoke, at the very least, in conversations with our secular friends, these, these ideas of transcendent virtue or human flourishing in a broader context as things that we should aim for in our work with each other and with the poor and the marginalized. 
right? Um, I have tremendous respect for the people that won the Nobel Prize. They tend to work on health, education, microenterprise, right? And we can't reduce human flourishing. Human flourishing is not reducible to those three outcomes, right? And, and, and our faith tells us, tells us that very clearly. Um, it also differs in how we measure progress toward these goals, right? If our goals are different, our metrics ought to be different. And, some, and I, I think some development NGOs, faith-based development NGOs, kind of punt on this because, well, how do we measure spiritual growth? Or how do we measure socio-emotional skills? And you can measure those things. We measure those things all the time. So we can measure them, and we should measure them as, as integral to human flourishing. It also affects the means that we employ toward our goals. Right? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, if we don't do things in love, they basically don't count. Right? So, so if we're not doing what we do in love overtly, then, then we're not really doing God's work, is what that, tells, what that, what that speaks to me. So it affects our, our, our motivation, it affects our goals, it affects our measurement, and it affects our means, you know, how, we actually, how we actually do these things, how we treat the poor with dignity, or in a patronizing way in our, in our interventions that, that I think separates, um, can separate our um, faith-based efforts. So the, the, the fifth area, the fifth, um, fifth stage is what I call introspection. So this is after looking at what actually works, um, what actually is effective, then we kind of look a little bit inward, either at ourselves or even like our organization, and, and think like what Gifts and abilities do we have that, mat, that are a match with the needs that we seek to meet? So what we're looking for is a confluence of like a prompting of compassion to meet a genuine need, global need or local need among the poor. Um, we're looking for something that's sustainable in light of our resources, right? So we're out of the idealism phase, something that we can actually follow through on and commit to. And we're moving toward, that, to, toward balancing that, that match between the need and a feasible role that... that um, that you can play. So in the book, I talk about, about six roles. And actually, on my blog, I have a test that you can use to sort of see like, which of these you score highest in. And I'm just going to describe them really quickly here. So, um, so one role is investigator. So that's maybe somebody more like me who's looking at kind of what works, what doesn't work. But not just economists, like people also who give us a framework for thinking about how we should engage global poverty. Right? Or people that, are, people that are helping practitioners to do, better, to do better work. Those would be investigators. Givers are people who have just this natural inclination to give, whether it's, whether it's money, somebody who's been blessed with a lot of monetary resources, or even time. An advocate. There are many verses in, in, in the Old Testament that talk about the person who gives voice to the poor. Right? So somebody who stands alongside the poor and pleads their cause. Or, or draws attention to their case is an, is an advocate. A creator, somebody who starts a social business or has ideas that change the way that we do development, that we do development work. Um, somebody who starts an NGO or a nonprofit or, or innovates a new approach to doing something. A director is some people like me aren't really huge fans of administration, but other people love being the person who makes the machine work well. And that is such a blessed, Occupation, right? Being that person who makes everything work. And some people just feel such a strong calling to do that. And it's great. Bless you. I'm not that person, but I'm very grateful for you. <laughs> um, practitioner. This is somebody who's, who's actually in kind of, in, 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 you might think of sort of the hands and feet of the operation interfacing with the poor. So this could be, this could be a teacher. It could be a public health worker. It could be a nurse, a physician, an agronomist, a water engineer. Right? So somebody who's actually doing the physical work um, in the midst of those, of, those living, um, of those living in poverty. So the last exercise is, is um, just even in these very brief descriptions of these roles, like think about which one, even initially, you identify with the most. Um, and I'd like to just sort of ask each one. So, so uh, who sort of sees themselves as an investigator primarily? That's like their primary, primary role. Raise your, raise, your, raise your hand high. OK, great. Okay, who, who sees themselves as a giver, primarily as a giver? Great. An advocate, the person who gives voice to the poor. Um, a creator, somebody who loves to innovate, to start things. Yeah. A director, 
an administrator, somebody who loves making it work well. Great. And the, the practitioner, the person who wants to be there, the teacher, the health worker, the mentor. Great. Did you notice how pretty evenly distributed these hands are? Every time I ask this question to a big group, I'm always impressed how many there are for each one and how evenly distributed it is. And what that means is that there are people with all of these gifts, and all of these gifts are important. They're all critical to this effort. So just because like you're a director and, and um, you're, you're, you're the person who's, who's more in the administrative role, I guess I would just, just encourage you by saying that is a, a precious gift because there are a lot of people who are investigators like me or practitioners who just can't do that job and that you're absolutely valuable and, and that you shouldn't try to think of yourself as a practitioner or an advocate or an investigator or, some, or a giver, right, primarily. That, that, that just to let God speak to you about what you love and then, and then harness that love for his kingdom work um, outside with the poor. So where investigation and, and, and introspection meet, I would call the sixth stage, which is, which is impact. When those two meet, then we see impact. P- people doing what they love for people that they love, doing things that genuinely have a positive effect on them. There's a seventh I that I talk about in the last chapter of the book, which is identification. Identification. So it's something that's kind of, in a way, it's, it's, it's sort of beyond impact. It's almost sort of a, I would, I would describe it as sort of a spiritual, a step of spiritual growth. Uh, and I'll describe what that is in a second. So, so here's, here's Dr. Yi, and I want to show you what his, what his waiting room, his reception area looks like now. This is what it looks like. So it was in 2011 when he made that first trip to Jamaica. And this is only a partial list of the places that he's been. Now he flies somewhere every few months. Um, so so he, he, has a, he has a little thing going in San Francisco where he works among the poor in his own city. Um, he, he, he goes to Haiti, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Nicaragua. He has this list of countries that he goes now. And he's even thinking of just kind of like phasing out his San Francisco business and just and, and being a missionary dentist. He's learned to identify in that role and with people that suffer from dental problems. Um, so, so when does identification happen and what are the qualities of it? It's when we begin to identify and de- develop a solidarity with a specific person, a group of people, or a community. So in, in, um, in my own experience, a, a bunch of us started a group called, uh, called Mayan Partners back about 15 years ago. And, and, and it's a long story that I could talk more about later, but we, we actually committed ourselves to one village in Guatemala. And about 10 years ago, we decided essentially to marry that village. So we're committed. We were going to scale out and start Christian middle schools all over Western Guatemala. And, and one smart person in our group said, why don't we just scale in and just commit ourselves to just serving this one village really, really well. And that's what we decided to that's what we decided to do. And so we're just committed to this village. And so one of us goes every six months or so. We sponsor a middle school, a lib- community library, a preschool. We do microenterprise and health stuff. And when we, visit the, when we visit the village, it's just like a family reunion. We've watched each other's kids grow up. You know, we hug each other. And it's just um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and we've learned to just identify with these people and the different issues that they're going through. And, then they, and they pray for us, too, with the issues that we're going through. And it's something that we really love. Um, so we, we also, when we identify, we begin to see our commonality with the poor. We don't see ourselves as just, okay, we're the givers and you're the receivers. There's a very popular school of thought called effective altruism that is like that. It's like, it's our job, the people with the money, to be these sort of human ATMs for the poor. And we're the givers and they're the receivers. And, and when we begin to identify, we, we, we get past that. We get past the sort of savior mentality, and we begin to see our commonality with particular groups of people, how we're like them, um, how we're like them in our own, our own brokenness in just different ways. We're, we're all broken, but we're all equal. We're just, we're, just, um, we're just broken in different ways. So we commit ourselves in the long term to a specific group, um, group of people or, or community, and our desire becomes to see this group flourish. That becomes like our heart desire is not just to accumulate more and more entertainment for ourselves, but to actually see what makes us happy is to see this group flourish. What makes us as happy as anything 
is to see is to see kids educated, to see them to see them come to know Jesus, to see um, to see people li living in dignity and flourishing in different ways. Um, so that's it for my talk. I have two little <laughs> infomercials that I want to inflict on you at the end of end of the talk, and um, and so so I've become the director of this thing um, in the middle of San Francisco, which is the Westmont. Do you guys know Westmont College? It's sort of like Wheaton West. Uh, and, um, and they own this in the middle of San Francisco, which is a living learning community that we're converting into a poverty and development studies center. And there are two opportunities. One is for undergrads. I know there's some undergrads here. You may have friends that are interested in this. And we actually have Wheat some Wheaton students already before it's been transformed into a development center. But um, to come spend a semester with us in San Francisco and take courses in development economics and immigration studies, theology of poverty and development. Um, we're having a class on uh, 21st century technology and the meaning of life this spring, which is all about digital technology and how it affects our lives and promotes um, um, and, and its relationship with human flourishing. Um, so this is an opportunity that, you, that, that a Wheaton undergrad could do in any, any semester, and we would love to have you there. The second infomercial is for recent grads, so people that have just graduated from Wheaton, or people that are about to enter master's programs, or people that are just leaving master's programs. And it's a certificate in analytics and program evaluation that covers statistics, experimental economics, econometrics, and, and machine learning. And, the, and with all with applications to understanding the impact of poverty programs, kind of like the studies that, it, that I showed you before. Um, so if you're interested in that, if you're interested in program evaluation and learning these more sophisticated techniques, this program is built for people that hate math. Okay, <laughs> if you hate math, but you desire to be a program um, evaluate a development program evaluator, this this program is basically built built for you. Um, so we start very very slow with statistics and learning how to program in in R programming language R, and we take you all the way up through machine learning, either over the course of a summer in the intensive version, or over an academic year where you where you get to actually in both cases you get to live at the house. And, um, and participate in Christian community. And if you do it over the academic year, we place you in an internship in San Francisco, which is likely to be paid. Most of them are paid. Um, so if you're interest, interested in that, um, yeah, Laura was passing around a sign-up sheet. So, so please feel free to sign up if you'd like to receive an email from us just letting you know how to, um, how to apply for the program. So thank you very much. It's been, it's been wonderful talking to you this evening. Thank <laughs> you.